focus on the things that I can control. And at the end of the day, I couldn't control the crash. I couldn't control the semi going through intersection. I couldn't control um, who survived and who didn't. Like some of my best buds and teammates and family members passed away that were right beside me, behind me. And that doesn't make sense. And I can't control why I'm here, why others aren't. All I can really control are my actions, my beliefs, how I want to proceed forward and how I want to honor those who are here. In April of 2018, I laid out sticks for the Humboldt hockey players who were in a terrible bus accident on their way to their game. 16 people lost their lives that day and there were 13 survivors. Today I have Caleb Dahlgren who not only survived the accident but he is living big and trying to make the most out of life. Caleb, I feel like I already know you because I got a chance to read your book before we talked today and you're just an incredible person. That's thank you. I don't know about that, but thank you. Appreciate no, that. you are. So when I first asked you to be on this podcast, I wanted to talk about how you overcame this tragedy, but I learned that you had to overcome a lot more than just that leading up to it. And you truly just make the most out of your life. And so we're going to start kind of from the beginning. Like me, you grew up around hockey and hockey was your number one thing. So Tell me what it was like growing up. I absolutely lived, breathed, and died hockey. That was my go-to. Uh, everything in my life revolved around hockey. I was fortunate enough to have parents who were super supportive of it and friends who were always by my side, rooting me on. So I'd say at the end of the day, I was very grateful for that opportunity to even play the game and be a part of the teams and create families. So uh, as a kid, I was a diehard hockey fan. We'd go to Musha Warrior Games, which is like a CHL team in Canada. And uh, I absolutely fell in love with it. That's awesome. That's how I felt. And when you were growing up, you were very young when you found out that you had type 1 diabetes. And I know that's very hard for anybody, let alone a competitive athlete. So tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah. So at the age of four, I actually was at my babysitter's and it was everything was going great. I always would go to her house, but today was a little bit different. And I was going to the bathroom multiple times and drinking lots of fluids. And I ended up drinking one of those four liter jugs of milk um, and was going to the bathroom over a dozen times before lunch even happened. So she called my dad and was like, hey, Caleb, something's wrong with him. You need to take him to the hospital. So my dad was able to get off work and take me to the hospital. And sure enough, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And while I was in the hospital, it was hard because I was getting poked and prodded with needles. And I thought, okay, as soon as I leave the hospital, I'm home free, no more needles. So then I go home just to find out I need another needle. And so that was a tough part for my family and myself was just coming to terms with me needing needles to survive. And so in the first couple months, I would challenge my parents to say, you don't love me. Why are you hurting me? This isn't fair. And I try to hide from them and I didn't want to play. I played hide and go seek, but I didn't want to be found. And uh, it was super difficult for us at that time. But I think moving forward after a couple months, I really got to learn that I needed needles to survive and that that was my life moving forward. And so I try to find the positive in that situation. And it really does make you more mature, more self-aware with your body. You have to watch what you're putting in carbohydrates wise um, and count your carbs. And so for me, that was what I had to do, count my carbs and give myself insulin based on what I ate. So um, lots in the fitness industry can relate to counting calories or carbs or anything like that. So yeah, um, you and I are on the me, same page. <laughs> yeah. That was my new normal was just trying to count the carbs and, make sure the insulin match the carb ratio. And then as an athlete itself, um, it was hard because during games I had to go high and then during practice I go low. So it was trying to find that balance to handle both situations. And yeah, it was a challenge for sure, but I was able to persevere through it and follow my dreams and passions. And you wanted to shed some light on that type one diabetes. So you started, is it diabetes? Yes. Yeah. I started a program called Dogger's Diabetes. And so like growing up, I really didn't have that influential figure. There's Bobby Clark who had type one diabetes. I played in the NHL. And other than that, you really didn't hear of anybody else. And Bobby Clark's era was before my era of growing up. So I really didn't get to watch him on TV or anything like that. And then Aaron's like, oh, what about Max Domi? But Max Domi is only a couple years older than me. So we aren't really that much different in age. And uh, yeah, it was like alone. And when you carry a diabetic bag to school and looks like a little bit of a purse. You get derogatory names called at you, or even if you go to the bathroom and you give yourself a needle and somebody walks in, they might freak out. And that has happened multiple times. And 
elementary school. So it was just difficult growing up with it. And you wanted to be considered normal and you are a normal person. You just have to manage it and not let it manage you. And so for me, one of the big things was to help the children growing up uh, with the disease and to create some awareness around it. And so I created this mentorship program called Dollarine's Diabetes. And uh, I wanted them to feel beautiful for their disease and not feel alienated or anything like that. And so what had happened was they'd come to a Broncos game. Uh, they'd get a pregame meal at Joins Bistro with their family. Then they'd get complimentary tickets to the game, get to wear the Die Beauty jersey, type 1 diabetic. And then they participate in a ceremonial face-off to start the game with me and the captain of the other team. And uh, then they'd watch the game. And afterwards, I'd go upstairs, meet with the family, and just talk about my journey with type 1 diabetes. Um, and then I'd add them to our Facebook group chat with all the other Die Beauty families. And I'd go to their school and do a school presentation. So the end of the day it was really great and it was a full circle because i want to create a bond with them and so if they had questions like i had as a kid growing up they could be answered by somebody or even if they needed some inspiration they look up to someone and say hey he's playing hockey at a high level i can do my whatever i want to do if i want to be a singer i want i can be a singer or if i want to be a dancer i can be a dancer and so that was kind of the inspiration that i wanted to create within the diabetic community and awareness around it too and that's kind of what i was talking about when i said even before what happened had happened is that you always wanted to do more and help people. And you were just a very inspiring person. And I mean, it speaks volumes that you started this program just because you wanted to help others and you wanted others to feel safe and feel like they have a happy place. And Mm -hmm. that's kind of is what brought you to the Humboldt community because you wanted somewhere where your program could really excel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for me, I was in Notre Dame and I was a there and it's a town of Wilcox, which is 400 people. And I wanted the community to really rally around this initiative because it, I wanted it, the, them to feel special. And so when they did get that open and ceremonial face off, the fans went absolutely nuts and the kids would get a big glowing smile on their face and they love it. And that was a big thing for me was I wanted them to feel special and not different. And so when they did that, I felt special and th- thought that 400 like the community of 400 people was just not the right fit for it. I want it to be something bigger and like more celebrated and stuff. And I absolutely loved it in Notre Dame. And that was probably the toughest part for me was asking for a trade going into my 20 year old year when I was an assistant captain as a 19. And it's just, yeah, I had so much love for that community and organization that was really difficult for me. But then once I did get to Humboldt, I was able to launch it there. And I think that's where it really flew and took off was in Humboldt. So um, that was really a good spot for me to have this and, you're right. It was difficult, but I had to, I had to go somewhere else for this. It's been about three years this month since we had the accident. And I guess the biggest question that I have and that most people probably have is after something like that happens, how do you continue to move forward? Yeah, that's a great question. And for me, it's a big, long process. I took a multi-faceted approach. It wasn't just doing one thing that really helped me. It was a huge approach. And one of the big things I think out of it all was focusing on the things that I can control. And at the end of the day, I couldn't control the crash. I couldn't control the semi going through intersection. I couldn't control um, who survived and who didn't like some of my best buds and teammates and family members passed away that were right beside me behind me. And that doesn't make sense. And I can't control why I'm here, why others aren't. All I can really control are my actions, my beliefs, how I want to proceed forward and how I want to honor those who are here. And then also I kind of put myself in their shoes. So if I wasn't here today, how would I want others to live? And that's like obviously a deep question, but it's really real and true. And so for me, that was one of the things I took forward was if I wasn't here, I'd want the survivors to live their life to the fullest, to enjoy everything and to really just create happiness within their lives and to not be stuck on this situation and to move forward. And so that's what I've tried to do. And I think that's what all of us have tried to do as well is to move forward and live in their honor, but still do our own thing and go our own paths. So um, I'm really, I say those are a couple of things. And then I guess one other aspect is just find the positives in the grind. Uh, we all have our own grind, whether us work, school, jobs, um, relationships, family. We really have, even sports too, we all have the grind and to just enjoy that grind because life is short and we could be gone tomorrow. So to truly just love as deeply as you can to enjoy every moment as you can, because you never know when it's time to go. So reading your book, you talk about positivity and that's something that I found consistent throughout the entire thing. Everything that you've gone through, through diabetes, through your dad being sick, you were a very positive person. How do you keep that mindset? And do you, where did that come from? 
Yeah, I think it came from my parents at a very young age. I'm very grateful to have such amazing parents who have instilled these values in me. And I think even throughout my hockey career too, with even diabetes in the first place, I had to find the positive in it because nobody likes being dealt with a disease for the rest of your life. Um, and if you do stay on the negative side, then it's only going to get worse for you. So for me, I always try to focus on that positive at a very young age. And then growing up, um, for me, it was always just trying to make the most of every situation I was dealt. And sometimes in life, life's not fair and it is difficult. And even with the pandemic going on right now, people can relate to having the difficulties in different areas that they never had before. And so to find that positive and to try to improve and try to grow in the negative situation is strength, I think. And uh, for me, after the crash, some of the hope that I had was just focusing on one positive thing a day and even having like gratitude too. And so today I have a gratitude journal or everyone call it. I put in my phone, it's three little things I'm really grateful for every day. But beforehand, during the crash and afterwards, it was just the 1% better every day. So for me, the only positive in one day was that I was live and breathing. Um, the next day was that like, I had support around me. And then the third day was I got up and took a walk, went to the bathroom by myself. The next day um, I was able to actually talk and converse with people. So it was just more of finding that positive and focus on the positive instead of the negative and getting 1% better every day to truly grow and to be your best self. So for me, that's what I've done um, through the tough situations is trying to find that positive and get 1% better every day. I love that. Everything that you just said right there is something that I try to tell people and I try to practice myself. And I don't think anyone can just sit in a negative mind space and ever be happy. So having that positivity and having the, like you said, 1% better every day, waking up and training your brain to think positive. Cause I really do think you can train your brain in order to do that so that you start to look on the bright side of things. And mm -hmm. you always talk about in your book to live big, which I think you got yeah. from your dad. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So growing up, uh, I always had like big events or things like that, where we try to make fun of every situation and even going to tournaments, my dad would bring a stereo, a smoke machine, strobe lights, and we do it big for the tournament and just get the guys going. And even in Saskatoon here, we had an exhibition game. We got it all going. And the rink secure, uh, the rink dude, uh, the owner of the arena came out, was like, Hey, is there a fire going on? Like what's going on in our room? Literally looked like there's fire, there's strobe light going on. So it was like, it looked like there's sparks and uh, there's smoke coming out. Music was blaring. So it literally looked like there was a fire. But it was just so fun. And I think I got it from my mom and dad, especially, and just to really enjoy life to the fullest because I found out at a young age when I lost my teammate and I lost my personal trainer, just how fast life can really switch. And that it's not really anybody's time per se, but it's just, it can switch up and literally just turn change an instant. And so I was kind of one of the big things was to really live life to the fullest because you never do know when your time is gone. And so I did that before the accident. I tried to always live big and make the most of every situation and to even just have fun in the small moments, make the small moments fun. And then after the crash, there's even more of a reason to do so now for the 16 as well who aren't here and to live in my live my life to the fullest for them too and also for myself. I do have to say something that I learned from your book because it's weird in the month of April, it was the 10 year anniversary since my dad had passed and he passed very sudden. And it was unexpected. And I, you know, was even like, do I need to go to therapy? Because I'm just scared that something's going to happen all the time. I'm scared that people are going to leave and get in a car accident. Or I'm scared, you know, anything that anyone does. Like I would just be the worst mother because I would not let kids do anything ever. And I did learn in your book that you got on a bus shortly after to go to, I think, a Caps game which yeah. shout out to Caps because that's my favorite team. And <laughs> you got on the bus and people asked if you're okay. And you 1000%, which in your rightfully so you said, no, that was basically a freak accident. Something like that doesn't happen. And that kind of gave me perspective for myself being like, Hey, you know what? He's right. This isn't something that happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was one of the big things for me. It was in the healing journey. It was that process because it was a freak accident and it was a once in a lifetime kind of thing. And and if it does happen, it does happen again, but hopefully it doesn't. I hope to goodness it never does happen again. But at the end of the day, I can't live life in fear because for me, I've been through lots of stuff and life is supposed to be fun and you're supposed to make the most of it. 
And if you don't really enjoy life to the fullest, or if you are living in fear, then you're not really embracing life to the fullest. You're not really making the most of your time while you are here. And so for me, that was one of the big things was that it wasn't that bus. It wasn't that situation. Um, it was just another bus. Like I've been on many other times in my hockey career and that I find comfort in a home in. So as you're recovering and you're going through your rehab, what do you think your number one motivator was? Ooh, I'd say my number one motivator was going back to Humboldt and doing it for the 16 who weren't here. And especially even like in the first couple of days in hospital, I really, really wanted to go back to Humboldt. And I really wanted to help that community heal because I knew how big of an impact it would have on them. Um, and so I really wanted to go back there. And that was probably one of my biggest motivations was just trying to get healthy enough to be back in Humboldt. Um, and then also to honor those who aren't here and to really just, like I said, enjoy the grind, but to just have fun with life and to heal to the best capacity I can and to hopefully one day play hockey for them. Ultimately, that didn't happen. But I think just to honestly be happy and live my life to the fullest and have those fun moments and to really make the most of everything that we have in life and to be grateful for all the support um, and even grateful for the time that I had with those people because there are 8 billion people in this world. And the fact that I had a relationship with those 16 who weren't here, those way on the bus is pretty special to say. Um, and I think that for me, that was one of the motivating factors was just to really continue on. And it also reiterated my belief to live life to the fullest before the crash. So after that was another big piece, but yeah, I think Humboldt was big. I even returning to play because I was previously committed to York university verbally before the crash. And then after the crash, they still offered the spot to me and still said I can come either this year, three years down the road, five years down the road, 10 years down the road. Uh, as long as I want to be lying, they're more than happy having me there. So I think that was another big motivator was just to follow my university dream of being a student athlete and pursuing that aspect of my life and my passion in that life. So I'd say there's a lot of different things uh, for me, but those are probably the three biggest ones. I love in your book how you wrote a piece about all 16 people that had lost their lives and what each of them have taught you, whether it be a life lesson, living in the moment, or just a different outlook on life. And so for those people who have gone through something hard or some sort of loss, what would be your advice to them? Yeah, I think to just reflect and be grateful for the time that you've had with these people, because in our whole situation of life, I think that we sometimes get lost in the moment of just trying to get through the grind of work, sleep, repeat, or even work, sleep, relationship, repeat, work, sleep, school, repeat. Like it's just, we get caught in that daily process and we lose touch of the things that really value and matter to us in life. And for me, some of the biggest things that matter the most are the relationships I have with people. And so I do think that we need to remember to always treat others how we want them to be treated and to always make sure we say I love you to everyone that we love in our life because you might not see them next time you do and you want to make sure that they know how you feel about them. And so for me, that was one of the big things. Um, and then also just to have gratitude for the time that was spent and to enjoy the memories and celebrate their life because um, you're fortunate enough to have that relationship with them. And so every year on the three-year anniversary, I celebrate the lives of the ones who aren't here. Um, I really like try to make the most of it and have fun with it and remember them for who they were as people and the type of things that they left on me. So when I did write chapter 16, it was the most difficult chapter by far. Um, that one and then right after the crash was hard, but that one in itself was pretty difficult. And it was just because I remembered all of them and I took away so many lessons from them. And uh, to just reflect on that was difficult, but it was also super nice to know that they did have an impact on me. And they truly did touch me in a special way. And now I can carry that forward throughout my life is living on with some of the things that they did teach me. That's amazing. I do want to wrap up our conversation with something that you said in your book that really stuck with me. Um, you said events happen, but life is about how you perceive the event and how you choose to react, which is something that really, really, I try to live by because I always talk about the victim and the victor and you can talk to anybody and they have their own story and everyone's fighting their own battle and everyone has gone through something, but it really, really does matter how you react to that. And I think that you're just such a great example 
of how you've overcome and you're a great role model for others. Your positive outlook is so inspiring to me and I'm sure to everyone across the world. And I just want to thank you for being a, a good person. And I'm really looking forward to what you're going to do for the rest of your life because you're still so young and you've done so much. And I really think you, the type of person that you are, you're going to achieve a lot and you're going to help a lot of people. And I think that's what it's about. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much. It really means a lot. And thank you for opening up to, I'm sorry about the loss of your dad. And I know it's hard, especially every anniversary is difficult in 10 years. I can't imagine. So I just want to say thank you for opening up about that too. And yeah, hopefully I am still young. I am 23, turning 24 here soon. So uh, still excited to write my story in this life too. And it's kind of just starting right now, to be honest. That was the first part one of my life. And this is the next exciting story to be written. And so uh, really looking forward to it and just excited to see where life takes me. Hopefully I'm able to help as many people as I can through chiropractic and uh, try to make a difference in the sporting world too. So really looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, I have your book here. So anyone who's watching or listening, it's called Crossroads. You need to read it. I actually, I think I was crying through like 75% of it, probably because our (laughs) our life is very, I feel like it's very similar in so many ways growing up hockey and, and having your dad and my dad. And it was just, it was a really good book. And I told all my hockey friends to read it. But for those of you who want to follow you on social media, or if they want to learn more about your diabetes, can you kind of spit out some information for them to find you? Yeah, for sure. So they can just find me at www.calebdahlgren.com. It's got all my socials in there, or they just type in at Caleb Dahlgren on any social media, because I keep it mainstream. I'm not too crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in my bios, there'll be lots about diabetes. So I'll have a link on Twitter and Instagram to my diabetes and then uh, I'll be working more on that to promote more of that stuff soon here. Um, it was just more focused on the book right now. But uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to moving forward with the diabetes and really excited to see where it can go. I, I don't know what's going to happen with it. Still discussing it with the families, actually meeting with all of them here coming up in the next month just to talk it over and see where they think the program should go. But uh, right now, it's just nice to have 16 diabetes and just chat with them and have that personal connection that I've always wanted with somebody. Well, I'm sure they appreciate it just as much as you do and you're making life easier for them. And that's what matters. Well, thank you. Yeah. And if everybody wants to reach out, I will respond to the DMs. I'm trying (laughs) to respond to everybody. Uh, But yeah, I just, I think that having that personal connection right now, especially when we're so in a virtual world and we can't really be one-on-one with people, it's nice to just have that conversation or talk to people about certain things. So I will be responding to all the messages as well. Great, Caleb. Well, thank you so much again for taking the time to talk to me and I'm sure everyone enjoyed this interview. Thanks for listening to today's interview. Make sure to check back next Tuesday for a new episode.